Our next author is Lee Goodison. Lee is from British uh, Columbia, Canada. She is the author of Wild Ones, a coming of age novel. Uh, also, the horse trailer owner's manual and goodies from the Great White North of uh, Food War. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in literary magazines and newspapers across North America since 1980. Currently, she lives in Battleground, Washington. Um, Wild Ones is a story of a 16-year-old girl in the foster care system who was sent to live on a ranch in southeastern Oregon. And uh, her parents have just been arrested for uh, federal overgrazing charges, and so I'm going to read from chapter 20, the first uh, scene, and it's not a spoiler. So. <laughs> <laughs> One good thing about living way out in the sticks, I thought, was that there was very little traffic in Denver. Every few miles, I had to slow down for an occasional tractor or other farm vehicle, grit my teeth, hold my breath, and pray as I finally forced myself to pass it. But other than that, it was pretty uneventful. A few more miles and we'd be back at the ranch. Jonathan's head had dropped down to his chest. I sneaked a quick look to make sure he was all right. He had fallen asleep from the hypnotic monotony of watching the side of the road whiz by. I smiled to myself and suddenly a flash caught my eye. Then the sound of a siren. I glanced up to the rear view mirror and felt my heart rate surge. A police cruiser was following us. And from the lights and siren, I knew I was supposed to pull over. I took my foot off the gas and let the truck slow down on its own. There was no shoulder at the edge of the road, one of those horribly deep drainage ditches like the one I'd walked into Jared's house. I didn't dare pull off any farther off the road. Eventually, the truck slowed enough and I put on the brakes and turned off the engine. The policeman stayed in his car for a few minutes where I could see him riding. Then he finally got out and approached the truck. My heart still pounding, I rolled down the window. The policeman was an older, heavy-set guy with a bright pink face and a stomach that hung over his belt. What well, was it with the men out here and their bellies, I wondered. With the exception of Frank and Jared, everyone else looked like they were smuggling watermelons. I was sure that if he didn't have a cruiser, he'd never catch a criminal if he had to chase him on foot. He gave me a disapproving look and glanced at Jonathan, Jonathan, apparently noticing his deformities and his expression changed slightly. License and registration, please. I sat there feeling stupid because I didn't know what or where the registration was, and as far as the driver's license went, I'd have to bluff. He saw my hesitation and said sarcastically, it's usually in the glove compartment. Is this your vehicle? I shook my head as I reached across Jonathan and popped the glove box open, clutching all the papers that lay inside in my fist. I spread them across my lap, having no idea what I was looking for. But he apparently saw what he needed and snatched a small square of paper from me. He scanned it briefly, then frowned at me. Your driver's license, miss? I, I left it at home in my purse, I gulped. From my peripheral vision, I noticed Jonathan's eyes slide toward my purse that sat on the passenger side floor of the truck. He pretended to stretch his legs, surreptitiously knocking his sweatshirt over it. A warm wave of affection for him flooded over me, but I pretended I hadn't seen what he'd done. Nor did the policeman, apparently. We were in collusion. What's your name? Breeze Jordan, and he's, I started to say, but the policeman interrupted me. He's old enough to speak for himself. He leaned forward to look across me at Jonathan. What's your name, son, he asked, his voice softening just a little. Jonathan Thompson, Jonathan replied. Good for you, kid, I thought. The policeman turned back to me, the annoyance returning. Do you have any identification on you? I shook my head. How old are you? He turned away from me and stared openly at Jonathan. Jonathan began to look scared, which in turn put me on the defensive. Sixteen. Really? You look more like fourteen to me. I saw fear spread across Jonathan's face like a rash and tears starting to form behind those thick glasses. This vehicle has been reported stolen. I'll tag it and it'll be towed and held until the legal, legal owners can collect it. My stomach turned over. Stolen? Who would have reported the truck as stolen? No one other than the feds and Jared knew that Emily and Frank weren't still at home. My thoughts drifted to Jared, wondering if he'd told his grandparents. I forced the feeling of despair and betrayal out of my mind and stared back at the officer. It's not stolen, I retorted. It belongs to Frank and Emily Thompson. Jonathan and I live with them. And if you have it towed away, how will we get home? I tried to cut the whine of fear out of my voice, but if the police officer didn't let us go soon, I was going to start sobbing the way Jonathan was now doing. You'll have to come with me, the policeman said. I'm charging you with unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. What's that? I whispered, terrified now. I dared not look at Jonathan. Car theft, the policeman said abruptly. When we finish booking you in juvenile court, I'll contact the Children's Services Division. We'll find a place to put you both tonight. We can stay together, right? I grasped Jonathan's flipper to reassure him. That's not up to me, he replied, but I knew from past experience it was highly unlikely they'd keep Jonathan and me together. We weren't related and we were foster kids. 
Without the Thompsons, we were back to freewheeling through the foster care system. And now I had a new title to add to my already colorful resume, car thief. <laughs>